Welcome everyone and happy new year. My name is Toby Heaps. I'm the CEO of Corporate Nights and it's my honor to moderate today's session. It's the third installment of the Canadian Earth Index series. And I'd just like to begin with some opening remarks before we get things underway. At Corporate Nights honors the peoples and land of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Corporate Nights acknowledges the land we are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Their culture and their presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Corporate Knights also acknowledges that Toronto, where we are located, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd also like to thank uh, our partner, IBM, for enabling this series. And before we get underway with the presentation and panel discussion, I'm going to hand it to um, Co my co-host here, uh, Chris, who is going to um, uh, provide some remarks from Minister Wilkinson, the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. First, uh, a thank you to Corporate Knights, not only for pulling together these five roundtables, but for the work that you do every day to ensure that we collectively work to define pathways that will enable us to effectively address critical environmental challenges such as climate change while accelerating growth and economic prosperity. Addressing Canada's emissions in line with what science tells us we must, while concurrently being focused on driving the development of a healthy, competitive and prosperous clean growth economy, has been at the forefront of this government's agenda since 2015. Recently, in my former role as Minister of Environment and Climate Change, I had the great privilege of helping to develop Canada's Strength and Climate Plan and to assist in bringing forward a new emissions reduction target for Canada that aligns with a commitment to 1.5 degrees Celsius and to achieving net zero in Canada by 2050. In developing Canada's plan, we have been focused on reducing emissions across all sectors of the economy and on looking to drive future growth through a focus on key areas where Canada has or can reasonably develop a sustainable comparative advantage. Comme les personnes ici présentes le savent, le rythme auquel nous innovons s'accélère, révolutionnant les secteurs économiques, redéfinissant la nature de la compétitivité. As folks here will know, the pace of change and innovation is accelerating revolutionizing economic sectors, redefining the nature of competitiveness. A seismic shift is underway in global financial markets, a rapidly evolving transition to a world in which low carbon products, technologies and services will be in ever increasing demand. Je pense que nous avons atteint un point tournant en termes de marché mondial du capital et qu'il n'y aura pas de retour en arrière. I believe we've reached the tipping point in terms of global capital and that there's no going back. Over the past six years, Canada has come a long way in the fight against climate change. According to independent experts, Canada is in fact well on its way to achieving its ambitious 2030 emissions reduction target. However, while we have done much to date, we must continue to work on these critical matters and to ensure that we have a bright future, both economically, environmentally and economically. This federal government is committed to working collaboratively with all of you to do more to that end. Today's discussion is focused largely on decarbonization of heavy industry in Canada. Il est clair que l'industrie lourde est un domaine dans lequel le Canada doit réaliser des progrès importants en matière de réduction des émissions, mais aussi des progrès importants en matière d'innovation afin que notre économie soit forte pour l'avenir. Heavy industry includes the oil and gas sector, which represents 26% of Canada's total emissions. It also, though, includes other major sectors that produce significant emissions, including steel, cement, aluminum, fertilizer, and others. Clearly, we need to reduce emissions in all of these sectors if we are to achieve our 2030 and our 2050 goals. However, we must concurrently, strategically, and thoughtfully look to seize economic opportunities that we can create in the transition to the low carbon future. In my mind, there are at least two major categories of such opportunities. Firstly, new demand and new products that are being created as a result of the drive toward lower carbon alternatives, such as electric cars and battery technology, 
but also enhance demand for things like critical minerals and hydrogen. It would include many clean technologies and also new approaches, such as those suggested by Alberta, Alberta Innovate's Bitumen Beyond Combustion Program. And secondly, there will be opportunities created from a demand perspective for traditional goods that can, going forward, be produced in an ultra-low-carbon manner, such as low-carbon steel and aluminum. In both of these categories, speed to market will be important, and success will require that we are strategic and collaborative in our approach. Canada's Strengthened Climate Plan was a big step down the path of driving a number of key economic opportunities that you and others have told us are available to Canada. Instruments we have put into place have included pollution pricing and other important regulatory mechanisms, but also significant funding through vehicles including the Net Zero Accelerator Fund, the Clean Fuels Fund, and support for carbon capture and sequestration technologies and projects. Le gouvernement fédéral cherchera à s'appuyer sur ces mesures initiales pour aller de l'avant et nous le ferons en reconnaissant que les principales possibilités offertes puissent être différentes en Alberta et au Québec et que nous devons agir de manière à assurer une prospérité continue dans toutes les régions du pays. This federal government will be looking to build on these initial steps as we move forward and we will do so in a manner that recognizes that the key opportunities that are available may be different in Alberta versus in Quebec, different in Ontario versus in Nova Scotia, and that we must act in a manner that will ensure continued prosperity in all regions of this country. In moving forward, we are looking for your thoughts and ideas. Success will require active collaboration and active involvement on the part of governments, industry, labour, Indigenous communities, and interested Canadians. As this audience knows better than most, companies large and small are increasingly embracing the possibilities and developing plans to capture the benefits of a clean economy that will be a $26 trillion opportunity, generating more than 60 million jobs over the next decade. It will not happen overnight, but it will happen through establishing ambitious goals, clear targets, and ongoing measurement and accountability. I know you have a distinguished panel waiting to jump in, so let me conclude. À l'approche de 2022, je suis optimiste quant à ce qui attend les travailleurs et les entreprises du Canada, car nous cherchons à résoudre le plus des grands défis environnementaux de notre époque, tout en nous efforçant de construire un avenir sûr et prospère pour nos enfants. As we move into 2022, I am optimistic about what lies ahead for Canadian workers and businesses alike as we look to solve the biggest environmental challenges of our time, while concurrently working to build a secure and a prosperous future for our children. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I certainly look forward to our conversations going forward. Merci beaucoup. So it's interesting to hear the Minister emphasize speed to market and opportunity. I think we're fortunate um, to have Minister Wilkinson in this critical climate role. When you look at his mandate letter, it's one of the longest mandate letters that I've ever read. He's in the middle of the entire decarbonization agenda and his past career situates him well. Um, unlike many politicians who herald from different communications and legal backgrounds, he has a business background and a successful business background at bringing clean tech opportunities to market. So I think we're, we're fortunate to have uh, Minister Wilkinson in place, and uh, he's right. We are we are underway toward our 2030 target, um, but we're not moving anywhere nearly fast enough. Um, we're going to hear some uh, a bit of a sober reality check on that from our director of research, Ralph Torrey, and maybe just just by way of context before Ralph gets underway. Other countries uh, in the G7, uh, other peer countries of Canada, are are coming to this realization that we're moving nowhere near fast enough to follow through on our on our commitments. And today, just before the session started, uh, Germany announced that it will unveil a set of, and this is the language they use, the German language, usually pretty conservative, a set of emergency policy measures to curb emissions within three months. Uh, their economy and climate minister said that uh, earlier today because they have acknowledged they're, they're nowhere near on moving fast enough to meet their, their 2030 targets. So they're going to introduce emergency measures to, to get up to speed. And, 
and there's a big prize uh, for, for winning because the demand right now is outstripping supply. And as the minister highlighted, uh, there's some huge opportunities for Canada, including the bitumen beyond combustion, uh, which uh, includes many things, but perhaps chief among them is the carbon fiber opportunity. And, and carbon fibers have the opportunity to really create lightweight um, materials that are going to be really critical for the electrification of transport for electric vehicles. And it turns out that in Alberta and Saskatchewan in the oil sands, the bitumen is ideally suited um, from its uh, various geological characteristics to be uh, the world's feedstock for carbon fibers. A little bit of R&D is required. A lot of R&D is underway and uh, there's a huge opportunity there. So it's nice to hear the minister acknowledge that. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass it over to Ralph Torrey, uh, our director of research, who has uh, been studying decarbonization, proposing solutions for decarbonization in Canada and around the world for the past uh, four decades. Ralph? Um, thank you, Toby. I'm not sure that it's a compliment to be described as someone who's been working on decarbonization for 40 years, given how little we seem to have to show for it so far. But on the other hand, we do seem to be at the cusp. Uh, we're turning a corner, I think, on our understanding of what the path forward might look like to a low carbon uh, economy, a low carbon and more sustainable society. And with the Earth Index Initiative at Corporate Nights, what we have been trying to do, what we are doing, is we're taking that challenge of achieving the low carbon transition breaking it into what we've identified as five key uh, target areas, if you like, including buildings and the electricity supply and our, our transportation and mobility system and our agricultural system. And last but not least, in fact, far from least, our industrial, and in particular, our heavy industrial sector. And I have to say that of, of all of the areas that we've identified, this one seems maybe the most challenging. With areas like buildings and vehicles and the power supply, there is a, a path forward that's emerged in the last few years around which there's a fairly strong consensus about what a post-carbon, low-carbon future might look like in those areas. But when we look at the heavy industrial sector, it's more complicated because the nature of what that sector will be producing in the future is also changing at the same time as the, uh, the conventional technologies and processes employed in that industry are being challenged to reduce their carbon intensity. We are, when we look at this sector in Canada, for purposes of the Earth Index uh, focus, we're not including the petroleum industry per se in our scope of heavy industry, nor are we including the mining industry. We've zeroed, we are looking at those industries, but for the heavy industry sector, as we've been defining it, we're focusing on cement, steel, industrial chemicals, the pulp and paper industry, the non-ferrous metals, so the smelting and refining, including aluminum, these five. And what we see when we look at these uh, is first of all, uh, by definition, they are very energy and emissions intensive, many times more energy and emissions intensive than other manufacturing industries, and even more so when compared to the service uh, sectors that now comprise most of the Canadian economic output. Another thing that one notices right away is that non-energy related emissions are important to this sector in a way that's not so true for most of the other sectors of the economy. Half of the greenhouse gas emissions from these five industries are not related to the combustion of fossil fuels, but are related to the actual chemical processes that are going on inside those industries to do what they do. And this in turn relates to uh, another fundamental uh, point about these industries is for them to actually reduce the emissions that they are putting out goes directly to the way that to their process technologies to the way they do what they do in a way that's not as true for the other sectors you can't have a significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions in a steel mill or a pulp and paper mill or an industrial chemical refinery uh, or a smelter without going to a rethink of the actual process itself 
And so this ties the problem in this sector to the capital turnover cycles, which is another dimension of how wicked the emission reduction challenge is for these sectors, because the capital uh, that's involved in, in these uh, production facilities is fairly long lived. And so the opportunity is to have a deep impact on the emission profile of these facilities uh, doesn't come up all that often. And if you miss that opportunity, it, it'll be a long time before it may come up again. Uh, at the same time that, that these industries are, are facing these challenges, they, they also work in, in a, an environment of uncertainty and a market of uncertainty, which is extraordinary. Partly because of the carbon transition itself, there is a lot of innovation going on in the world looking for uh, how to make things lighter, how to make things uh, with less energy and less emissions, with less steel, with less concrete. And so the future magnitude and makeup of the products that will be demanded from these primary processors is also up for grabs. And it won't change quickly, but it will change quickly enough that it interacts with that long capital cycle I was just referring to, adding another dimension of wickedness, if you like, to the problem of emission reductions from this conventional heavy industry sector. There is much that can be done, we know that, and we have Chris Bataille on our panel this morning who will address some of the options. We know that there are technological opportunities for electrification and efficiency, process innovations, uh, recycling, and so on, that can have very significant impacts on emissions from these industries. But the fact remains that in the last 15 years, emissions from these five industries have not gone down very much at all, less than 1% per year. If they are going to meet their prorated share of Canada's uh, 2030 target, they would have to be bringing emissions down over the next 10 years by more than 4% per year. It suggests that incrementalism is not going to be an effective strategy in this case, that we really need disruptive and breakthrough strategies that can see a primary processing industry emerge in the post-petroleum or post-carbon era, which is fundamentally less environmentally intensive and less uh, carbon intensive than the primary processing industry that characterized the 20th century. In that regard, uh, it brings me to sort of the second aspect of how we're looking at this. The first one being, if, if, if it's not obvious, what can be done to reduce the carbon intensity of the steel and cement and chemical industries in Canada. The second dimension being, what are the implications and what are the opportunities to primary processing and primary materials industry of the low carbon transition itself? And here the possibilities I think are quite exciting. Uh, you know, Prime Minister Mackenzie King once quipped that if some countries have too much history, we have too much geography. Well, you know, we're only half a percent of the world's population, 1.4% uh, of the world's GDP, 1.6% of, of global greenhouse gas emissions, but we're the second largest country in the world. We have 6% of the global land mass, 9 million square millimeter, uh, millimeters, <laughs> 9 million square kilometers, over 4% of the world's arable land, 20% of the world's fresh water. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it, with respect to the bitumen resource, as Toby was mentioning, 70% of the proven global reserves. And of course, uh, we're sitting on a, uh, a, an enormous st uh, store of strategically important minerals, including cadmium and cobalt, graphite, indium, nickel, others that will be important in the transition to a low carbon future. Now, historically, the exploitation of this disproportionate abundance of natural resources has been a defining feature of Canada's economic development because a relatively small share of the world market for any of these resources has resulted in a relatively large per capita export earnings for Canadians. You know, the prairies became known as the breadbasket. Harold Innes coined the or used the term hewers of wood and drawers of water to describe Canada's dependence on re resource production. And the other side of that coin is that the perennial struggle to move up the value added curve has plagued Canadian economic progress and the export of primary resources rather than higher value added products remains an ongoing challenge uh, for Canadian economic development. And here is where history 
an opportunity and the low carbon uh, challenge converge to, to create what could be uh, an historically momentous opportunity for the Canadian economy to combine its historical experience with primary materials development and processing with its advanced industrial know-how to develop what will be the primary processing and primary material sector of the post-carbon uh, economy, which will necessarily have to be a low carbon uh, sector and which will necessarily have to be a high value added sector. The only hope for a low carbon transition will be a future in which all energy and all materials are used with very, very high levels of efficiency and circularity. In other words, with a very high level of value added to the original resource. And in this regard, uh, Canada is positioned, I think, to, to play a leadership role in showing the way to a global uh, post-carbon primary sector, while at the same time addressing its perennial challenge of moving up the value added curve in its industrial production. There are two cases that we are taking a particularly close look at in, in our exercise here at Corporate Nights. I will only mention them because they will come up uh, and be addressed by people who are much more knowledgeable than myself during our panel discussion. But the first one, which Toby has already referred to, is the possibility that the bitumen resource itself, which has become the bad boy of carbon intensity in the, in the challenge for achieving a low carbon future, could end up playing uh, a central role as a resource material for the light weighting and some of the other opportunities that the low carbon transition presents. Uh, and then the second of the two, uh, also referred to by the minister and by Toby, is the uh, opportunity presented to Canada by virtue of its strategic mineral reserves and, and uh, the need that those uh, mineral, the need for those minerals that is being driven by the move towards electrification both for batteries and for everything from the turbine blades to other elements of the renewable energy technology um, juggernaut. And so uh, I guess it's good news and bad news in a sense, just to sum up, I think that we do face uh, difficult challenges in decarbonizing our traditional primary processing sector, but there are ways to do it and we'll be hearing about some of those. And secondly, uh, on the good news side, I think that the transition uh, to the low carbon future. Uh, and obviously there will have to continue to be a primary processing sector in that future, opens the door to enormous opportunities for Canada to play a leadership role in the development of its minerals and resources in a way that's both low carbon and which facilitates export earnings while at the same time contributing to greenhouse gas emissions globally that will dwarf the emissions of our own industrial sector here in Canada. So that's the outlook, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some help from our panelists, so I'll stop now because we are, we are uh, working on this issue and, and looking for ideas and, and looking for strategic pathways uh, and finding it challenging in a way that, as I said at the beginning, is, is, is not so much the case for some of the other sectors that we're, that we're studying. So with, with that sort of introductory uh, context-oriented uh, remarks, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Toby and, and the panel for their for their contributions. Thank you for your for your attention. Thanks, Ralph, for, for that uh, really helpful overview and um, and for the call to arms uh, for us to escape from the box that Harold Innes put us in as, as a hewers of wood and drawers of water. Um, in paying particular attention to you know our our beautiful asset base uh, that poises us if if we so choose to uh, go down the carbon curve and up the value chain and be really at the heart of the global supply chain for some of these uh, critical low carbon materials um, that are gonna be needed both for making cars and buildings, um, batteries and, um, and other types of build structures. Uh, we have uh, Chris Bataille. Uh, I'll just give a quick uh, intro for the first time uh, when, when folks are, are coming in. Chris Bataille uh, has been working hard and in studying deep industry uh, decarbonization uh, for many years. He's lead author for the uh, central document uh, that comes out of the, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for decarbonizing heavy industry. And he thinks a lot about um, how to do this and is, is on top of the latest technologies and what's realistic. So, so Chris, if we're, if we're focusing in on 
just to start, you know, they're all different is uh, Ralph said, they can't be lumped together, but steel cement and petrochemicals are kind of most of the ball game from a direct emissions perspective uh, globally and, and in Canada, although petrochemicals are much bigger footprint in Canada than steel and cement. Oh, if you start with each one, maybe steel, cement, and then petrochemicals, what's a promising path forward for each one? And if uh, you're going to give some advice, um, counsel for Minister Wilkinson, uh, what's something material that needs to change here in Canada so that we can move down that path with greater speed? Thanks for having me for today. Um, I'd like to thank Ralph for that really nice summary there right at the beginning, with both of the good and the bad. Um, I just want to start my, my little soliloquy here with a rejoinder to Harold Innes. Um, we often hear this here is wood drawers of water thing, and that very much was true about Canada before World War II. Um, but there was a transformation in our economy that started then and continues today, and less than 10% of our GDP comes directly from natural resources, and less than 5% directly from energy. This is a high-tech manufacturing, high, you know, high value added manufacturing and services economy. Um, it's not, we're, you know, but regionally natural resources really matter. And that is the dynamic tension in our federation that we need to really look clearly at when we're addressing this question. Um, now, my, my specialty um, the last five years has been looking, how do we decarbonize steel, cement, uh, chemicals, what have you. Um, steel is really interesting because about, until about five years ago, um, it, it's, it and cement were looked at as the last sectors that would abate. They would be in the last 20%. But the, the Paris Agreement completely transformed how we look at those sectors because we have to get net, to net zero for all sectors by 2050 um, or offset with permanent verifiable and add, additive offsets. So suddenly steel and cement were in play. The good news is, is that a lot of research was actually done 30 or 40 years ago into how to decarbonize these sectors back in the era when we thought we'd have copious amounts of nuclear energy to work with, that we'd have lots and lots of clean electricity. So a lot of basic research and even piloting got done in how to do clean, clean metallurgy, fully clean metallurgy. Now, some of those plants got built, but then energy prices dropped out, the nuclear industry kind of just stopped growing. And we went back to the old and just kept micro, you know, micro refining the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace route for, for steel, especially. But it turns out when you start digging there, there's over nine different options to completely decarbonize the steel sector. Um, of, you know, both directly in the primary sense and, and secondary and from the secondary sector. The first big one is we need to recycle more and we need to recycle better. So there's a lot of reduced iron or elemental iron floating around in our economies that's not that's no longer being used. The trick is we have to get that back out of the economy in a high purity fashion and recycle it in electric arc furnaces and add just enough new pure, clean, pure iron in there to make it useful for all uses. And that's going to be the key, that's going to be the key strategy moving forward, however we get that reduced iron. There's a few different ways we can do that. Um, and Canada is ideally positioned to do this. Basically, we've got lots of clean electricity. We're an older industrialized power. We've got a lot, we've got a lot of recyclable scrap floating around on the landscape. <clears throat> And Quebec and Alberta are both ideally positioned, Quebec using hydroelectricity in its iron ore to make clean new primary ore to supplement the recycled scrap. And Alberta of all places has iron ore and could be using blue hydrogen as, as the reductant to strip the oxides off, off new iron ore. And in Quebec, obviously you'd make the hydrogen from electricity. Um, and with hydrogen being the new primary reductant instead of coal moving forward, and they're Oh, there's 10, two, two or three plants building in Europe right now to do that. There's 11 or 12. There's a big one in China that's being built that'll be operational later next year. So this is likely the path moving forward for steel one way or the other. You know, clean up the primary, the primary reduction, stripping iron, iron and oxygen from each other, and then getting that iron into the system along with the recycled. Now, the big challenge with steel, however, is a lot of the world's steel plant, many and most of the world's steel plants are coming up for what's called a blast, blast furnace relining in the 2025 through 2035 period. So we need to commercialize these technologies very rapidly, such that as, the, as those blast furnaces come up for relining, which is the key moment when we can switch it out, that we're ready, that we're ready to build those. And most of those furnaces are in China. Now, 
the news in Canada is both good and bad on that. So on the one hand, we've got a bunch of our steel companies have chosen go, to go down the electric arc furnace route and not renew their blast furnaces. And, and you can add new clean primary iron, but Stelco just, just relined one of their blast furnaces as of later, late last year. And that will be operating minimum 17 years and up to 25 years before. And it's, it's not in a place that's suitable for CCS. So that's just one thing. Um, cement is a really interesting sector in that about half the emissions can be eliminated fairly cheaply and easily um, through better design of buildings, minimizing the use, minimizing the use of concrete, uh, making better concrete that minimizes the cement in between the sand and, and stones and what have you, minimizes it's the, the amount that cement that's kind of filling in between all of those. And we're in Canada, we're, we have three different sizes, what are called aggregates, the stones that form up concrete. Um, we're on a better path. We're already in a slightly better place than say the Americas, which use two size of aggregates, which leaves lots of pore space between those. So first of all, cementious material substitutes, um, you know, ground limestone, calcine clays, blast for uh, slags of all types, waste of incineration, fly ash, what have you can be used to replace that. Um, but once you get that, once it through, that gets you down to about minus 40%, after that, you're going to need CCS uh, for the process emission, the limestone calcination process emissions. And in Edmonton, there's actually a 90% uh, full pilot scale pilot plant being built as, as we speak. So one of the two first places in the world that may have CCS actually operating for cement may be Edmonton, the other being Brevik, Brevik in Norway. Um, so, but we've we've paid a lot of attention in Canada to steel and cement, and you know our, our track record is we're doing all right. Where we're I don't think we're paying enough attention. The companies are paying more attention than than our governments are. Is net zero chemicals and feedstocks and fuels, and the Alberta, Alberta and Saskatchewan economies are ideally situated to be heading down the road towards net zero synthetic fuels for aircraft, net zero synthetic uh, ethane, ethylene, what have you, uh, using their CCS capacity. Capacity, using their high renewables capacity for clean, for clean hydrogen to make clean, much cleaner carbon, clean hydrogen, clean oxygen, and combining those Lego like into the chemi into the into the basic building blocks of of, uh, of chemistry, um, which sort of gets me back to the the whole CCS question. We've been failing on CCS as a globe um, since the late 1990s, and it's mainly because we've been attacking the hardest problem first. We've been trying to do it on post-combustion, poor post-combustion coal. So the, the flue gas that comes out of the out of the tail of that is very dirty. Uh, it's hard to work with. It messes up the, the solutions that we use to filter out the CO2. There are other technologies coming. You know, there, there have been maybe three marginally successful post-combustion coal plants globally. However, there have been over 50 very successful CCS projects, starting with a concentrated uh, flow of CO2 coming out of the process. So when you're making ethanol, when you're making hydrogen from methane, what have you, we know how to do this today, separate out the CO2 purely and put it and pump it underground. This is established oil and gas technology. So we need to, in my mind, we need to flip the strategy, stop focusing on coal, post-combustion coal and focus on all the easy CCS option first to get, get the transport net, get, get the disposal uh, sites operating, get the transport network in place and get and get us our, get practice with regulating the sector. Um, so the final comment I'll add to all of this, um, how do you trigger all this? It's lead markets. All this stuff is going to be more expensive than the standard operating method because it's been free to dump CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, you know, it, Clean, clean steel is possible, clean cement is possible, clean chemicals are possible, they're, but they're going to cost 20 to 20% 20 more, 40% more, up to two to three times more than the, than the chemicals we have today. But they're a very small part of the cost of final consumer products and final, and final intermediate goods. So we need lead markets. We need companies to commit to absorbing these, the new cleaner, chemi the new cleaner steel, cement, chemicals, what have you, passing the, the cost down to consumers. We need governments to engage in Green, green procurement, and there's been big movement on that file uh, last fall in terms of uh, green procurement for steel and cement um, by a consortium, in, a global consortium, including Canada. So we need those lead markets. We need early buy, car buyers to buy the green steel. We need building, co building construction companies to buy the clean cement. And we need a general focus on building the economies of scale and building the experience with making clean intermediate materials like this. And thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. That was really good lay of the land.
and um, the the sort of the I guess the the thing to make the itch happen is is creating these lead markets, and that's that's where there's a real role uh, for Canada uh, to play, which we're starting to play in terms of providing um, additional top ups uh, to to provide an incentive, a clear and, and and some reduce some of the uncertainty and produce more clarity to um, to invest uh, the you know the extra twenty to forty percent that it uh, it takes at the moment to to create these low carbon supplies. You talked a little bit about carbon capture and storage and made the point that it does, uh, we should be more looking to turn it away from coal uh, where it hasn't uh, led to uh, uh, such fruit, fruitful reductions and um, into the, some of the heavy industry opportunities. And I'd like to get, um, we have with us uh, uh, Murray and, uh, and, and, and Laura as well, who've done some thinking about this. And I'd like to, it would be, it would be interesting to get um, perspective from both of you uh, globally, there's some examples, uh, you know, um, for those of you who, who have not uh, met him yet, Murray Simpson, um, I think many of you will, will know him because of his uh, role at IBM as the global director of sustainability. He touches a lot of these topics, but Murray, you have um, some experience with carbon capture and storage. I wonder if you'd give us a bit of a sense of, you know, where you've seen it work and um, if what Chris said um, kind of checks out with your experience on the ground with businesses. Thanks very much, Toby. And uh, first of all, thank you to Corporate Knights uh, for this, um, you know, excellent forum, and to the minister for his his words. And also, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of, uh, of Canada, of course. Um, uh, it's a great opportunity to have such a, a fantastic panel and, and to be able to talk to you about this. And uh, I think one of the important things is, of course, to focus in on real real time case studies, real life case studies that are going on at the moment when we're considering these uh, these issues. Um, uh, I, I take Ralph's uh, point about his 40 years of decarbonizing the planet, but uh, don't be despondent, Ralph, you're on the right track. Just just keep going. Another 40 years, that's what I say. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and I've been working on sustainability and climate for, for over 25 years. Um, in um, more than 75 countries around the world. And uh, I have um, had quite a, a few dealings with uh, carbon capture and storage in, in, um, in different places around the world and, and with different companies. But what I'd like to focus on uh, is, as I said, a, a, real, uh, a real case study that uh, shows uh, you know, the, the potential um, and uh, of how we can address the issues that have been brought up by the various speakers so far and um and one of the things about this example which is actually um relates to mitsubishi heavy industries so mhi so very much sort of um front and center of the areas we've been talking about here because of course they're involved with all kinds of uh, elements that um that have just been discussed um is about ecosystems of partners and and platforms so it's, it'll be no surprise to you that I'm talking about technology, um, you know, being the uh, global uh, director of sustainability for IBM. Um, and, um, and technology is absolutely fundamental for us to be able to address the multifarious challenges of, of climate and carbon emissions. And I use carbon as a proxy for GHGs, of course. And, um, and so... When we think about ecosystems of partners, it's about bringing um, people together, organizations together that are right across the value chain, right throughout the supply chain, but also partners that, um, you know, they may be competitors in, in some cases, partners that are willing and need to work together for the greater good uh, without being too evangelical. The greater good, of course, um, includes, you know, commercial realities and the needs of shareholders and stakeholders um, in countries and in, in government and within the corporations and communities themselves that are affected. Um, so when, we, when we're looking at um, uh, MHI, uh, the example that I, that I mentioned, um, we, what we've done, is we're working with them to create a, a platform. Um, uh, the platform um, was actually launched and discussed at COP26 the climate, the global climate conference. For those who, I'm sure everybody's aware of that, but uh, just to be clear, a global climate conference that happens every year, except when there's a pandemic, um, and um, took place in Glasgow 
uh, last year in November. Um, and, um, you know, we, we were on a panel and uh, discussing this platform with um, a group of um, colleagues and partners, uh, along with uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. And, and what, we're, what we're doing is working with MHI and their partners and the ecosystem that they are, that they are a key part of to ensure that there is visibility across the carbon capture and storage chain. So what, what it is, it's about um, collaborating to create a digital platform that improves that visibility uh, of the existing issues and streamlines um, the, uh, the, the approaches uh, across the different industries that MHI are involved in, across the different partners and across that whole ecosystem. Um, and um, and that, what that does is it increases transparency, it increases traceability, and, and that dynamic e ecosystem enables um, us to be able to work together to address the emission of CO2. And, and I, one final point I'll make on this uh, approach, uh, this ecosystem approach, is that when, when one creates an ecosystem of partners, um, and a platform which encompasses that. Uh, what you also get, of course, is an ecosystem of data. And, and that is fundamental. Once you've got the start of an ecosystem of data that you can capture, measure, uh, benchmark, and then report, then you've got some real power that you can make some serious changes with. And, and the final thing I'd say on data is that, um, you know, Perfect is the enemy of good. We have to start somewhere. We have to gather data in an iterative way and then build upon it and build upon it and build upon it. And that's how we will make a, a difference. Yeah, if I may add to that, um, Murray, uh, couldn't agree with you more. And I think the ecosystem is needed, not just because we need different partners with different strengths, but we need to utilize and reutilize assets that are already on the ground now that may have been used for, for other um, areas. I, I particularly think, while we talk a lot about CCS uh, and the storage, we really need to talk about the utilization and the storage, the CCUS. And I think for, for us in Western Canada, here in Alberta, you know, clearly CCUS is a key component to unlocking some of our hydrogen uh, production. You know, hydrogen can be such a great feedstock for oil refining, petrochemicals, manufacturing, fertilizer production, many of the things that Ralph talked about, but also it can be used for combustion for industrial heat and power in places like Chris has mentioned in steel production. But it's also a transportation fuel for the future um, or, the, or the hydrogen fuel cells. But hydrogen can be produced so much more easily from hydrocarbons, you know, namely natural gas, uh, with low to no emissions when we couple it with CCUS. So I think when I start thinking about those assets we have in, in Canada, and, and I'm you know, um, more focused here in Alberta, I, I should say, uh, as, as a additive part of, of Canada, um, it's, we're extremely well positioned um, for our massive natural gas resources. Um, well positioned in that Alberta is already the 10th largest hydrogen producer in the world. Now that's still only 3% of the hydrogen, but with the amount of storage that we have available of, of, of carbon between Saskatchewan, Alberta, you know, the, the kind of often referred to as the prairies region, there's an awful lot of raw material there for more um, blue hydrogen in, in our case. You know, more recently that's been proved out with Shell and their Quest project at the Scottfield up, upgrader where they're taking 1.1 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, about 35% of what is produced by that upgrader uh, and we're using it to, to convert across into hydrogen. You know, we also can't forget the other infrastructures that are needed. Um, you know, we're putting in a carbon trunk line designed to transport 14.6 million tons of carbon dioxide a year for enhanced oil recovery. And we have 433,000 kilometer network of pipelines traditionally used for other areas. 
but that can be leveraged for hydrogen transmission. So I think the, you know, one of the things I think is very key here is this public private sector uh, move on CCS and CCUS uh, towards commercial projects that you mentioned. Let's not be perfect, let's get something going. And I think if, if we can use the existing assets uh, that there without needing those billions of dollars immediately to go into the system, but we still need some capital to, to activate and leverage what we're talking about. We can, do, we can really use CCS for the needs and priorities of, of industry while still reducing that emission. So can't agree with you guys more. Thanks, Laura. That's really, really helpful. Um, and, and many of you know Laura Kilcrease um, from our previous events and, and around, around the, the park in Canada. Uh, Laura Kilcrease, CEO of Alberta Innovates, and, um, and she's leading um, uh, a lot of people think of Alberta uh, in central Canada. They don't necessarily think of Alberta as part of the solution. But when you go to Alberta, you, in the, you look at what Alberta Innovates is doing and uh, all around Alberta, which is my home province, you see the tremendous entrepreneurial um, spirit and technology and there's there's a lot of hope for how Alberta could be really at the at the front front end of this uh, decarbonization push in a in a in a way that's 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 hugely op opportunistic for the economy as well. H how do we place it at the heart of the solution? Yeah, that's a really good good point. Um, from our perspective, we've been pursuing uh, an agenda that we call BBC Bitumen Beyond Combustion. Let's face it, there's two parts to this solution. Let's combust less so that we don't actually emit as much, but then let's find uh, a way where we use those same resources for something that doesn't need to be combusted and actually can pr produce value. So for us, where we see the future is we see it for both Alberta and Canada in a radically different way of using our bitumen. We want to take the bitumen and take from that the new uh, materials that the world is demanding but hasn't actually have readily available. Uh, some of those new materials or newer materials, I should say, is carbon fiber. You know, the fact that we have heavy bitumen is actually perfect because we have one of the greatest both sizes in quantity, but types of feedstock that you need to actually produce carbon fiber. Um, you know, Today's prediction alone is if carbon was a fiber was available in North America, it has a market a size of about 230 billion because it's not just the production of the carbon fiber from bitumen, but it's the ongoing value chain that Ralph mentioned earlier on because that carbon fiber will be used for automobiles, for airplanes, for all kinds of things that will also further the lower uh, um, uh, um, emissions agenda. So uh, number one, we see taking, you know, a barrel of oil and we see taking the heavy part of the oil out and leave the good, the, the nicer part of the oil as we think of it traditionally today. So it can still be processed into uh, petroleum, but it would be that much sweeter and that much more um, uh, va valuable. Let me concentrate on the other parts though. We can take from that heavy bitumen, we can take carbon fiber, we can take activated carbon that's gonna be needed in smart grids, in uh, storage of alternative energies, in all kinds of other areas that uh, progress our clean agenda. And then we can even take asphalt teams that we're gonna need for roads regardless. None of us are gonna stop traveling uh, as, as much as we're doing it temporarily during this pandemic. Uh, the world is going to still keep needing to, to travel. So, you know, people haven't thought as we look at production slowing down over the next 50 years of uh, oil and gas production, wherever it is in the world, our, our need for asphaltines is not going to go away. In fact, demand's going to go up. So when we start looking at this, you say, well, yeah, that sounds nice, Laura, but so what? Um, my so what is, this is not only an alternative way to use a natural resource that we have, that all peoples in this country have, but it's a way of actually increasing the value of the bitumen that we have, our natural raw materials. Again, Ralph said earlier on, we're so good at uh, uh, digging up, cutting down, transporting our, our raw materials to others. And I think Chris said the same, you know, it's more important that we actually get to a point to add value to this. So by taking bitumen, converting it to um, 
uh, carbon fiber alone, you know, it's going to add so much value to our economy. In fact, it's going to transform our economy, not transition our economy. It will transform it. And that transformation is so incredibly important today. Take a million barrels of oil today. If we take, if we split this between the light and the heavy, the heavy bitumen, we take the 400, roughly 470,000 barrels of that million a day, just by taking it and converting it to carbon fiber and, and, and the things I've talked about, but mainly carbon fiber, we'll say save 65 million tons of emission. More importantly, that portion of the barrel will now suddenly be worth somewhere around $170 to $180 a barrel. Now we're still going to see sell a little piece of that barrel, that other 500,000 off to, to uh, the traditional method, but that's only producing about $30 a barrel. So we can take what's really 30 bucks a barrel, add in the $170, $180 a barrel. Suddenly that economic basis for us allow is an incentive for us all to get together on this conversion uh, to alternative and new materials. So for me, it's not just sequestering the carbon, it's using the carbon, it's adding more value to the carbon. And in doing so, we create a whole new manufacturing sector. Because let's face it, in the manufacturing business, like the steel business, like many other businesses, you want to be close to your feedstock. And we have the largest amount of raw material feedstock for carbon in North America in one country. It's called Canada. So let's use it to get bitumen de derived BBC products, not the old BBC in London, the BBC here in Canada, bitumen beyond combustion. And let's actually just by carbon fiber alone, reduce our, our emissions by mm, 22 to 36% on a life cycle basis. But let's use it to produce other economic value other jobs and other things uh, here in this country. But let's, if I can just push us one stage further, let's not lose this opportunity, folks. This is an opportunity to progress now and for our, uh, and for our future. We already have early technologies and I won't talk about them. Dr. Chen will talk about them more, but let's find ways we can use bitumen and achieve our emissions reduction goal while still achieving and transforming our industries into industries of the future, while becoming strong in manufacturing uh, and, further the, and furthering our value chains. So Toby, that's just some of my thoughts on, on bitumen beyond combustion. Uh, I have many other thoughts on this, but uh, hey, let's take something worth 30 bucks a barrel, people, Let's make it worth 213 bucks a barrel. And then let's use those that, that economic driver, the industry will continue to come to the table to take a share in, in, in those assets. Thanks, Laura. Uh, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking about uh, back in the days of, of Peter Lougheed when Alberta was just a conventional oil and gas kind of place and um, some far-sighted visionaries saw the potential to extract um, and create uh, billions, even trillions of dollars of value uh, by being able to tap the, the resources in the bitumen. At the time, they were, they were considered crackpots, alternative energy crackpots that weren't even allowed in the Petroleum Club in the Calgary. And uh, Peter Law, he'd invested uh, more than a billion dollars in today's dollars uh, to help uh, advance the R&D cycle and get the technology in place where then the commercial sector could come and, and really make hay. And, and it was a tremendous wealth creation opportunity story for Canada um, in the ensuing decades. And now we find ourselves at a similar juncture in the road. And, um, and, and it's, it's for a, a commodity that the world's hungry for, this lightweight carbon fibers that are, that are affordable. And the car industry would love to switch to them overnight, but they're not because they're just a little bit too expensive at the moment. And we have this opportunity to bring that cost down globally and uh, huge emissions reductions globally and also huge economic opportunity. And so it's really kind of neat that we have with us Dr. Chen, who's the founder and chief technology officer of uh, one of the most interesting firms uh, in this space, extracting carbon fibers uh, from, from the bitumen. 
And uh, it'd be really interesting to hear from you, Dr. Chen, about where you guys are at and uh, what you see as the opportunity to uh, break through and uh, bring us um, you know, along the cycle from in, into, the, into, the, into the carbon age. So uh, over to you, Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you, Toby, for the introduction and uh, previous panelists to share your thoughts on how to advance the green industrial wave. Uh, my name is uh, Wei Xin Cheng and CTO <clears throat> of the uh, newly created uh, Thread Innovations, uh, which was recently uh, spun out of uh, Adrian Industries. Uh, Thread believes in the future of carbon materials as an input for the benefit of the environment and society and are committed to advancing the green industrial wave. Um, Thread Innovations uses asphaltines, the heaviest component impeachment to uh, fabricate carbon fiber using a patent painting technology. Thread is fortunate to have a highly supportive government and abundance of bitumen producers who are looking for ways to use its bitumen resources to uh, create, create advanced materials. Uh, Thread is currently developing the pilot production facility which will manufacture carbon fiber from bitumen based pr products for independent third party validation and to generate samples for global consumers of carbon fiber and prospective new users of carbon fiber. Um, pilot production commences by the end of May 20, uh, uh, 22, at the end of the year. Thread plans to uh, commence commercial production by end of uh, 2024. We are committed to utilizing Alberta's labor, power, and resources with the global, uh, with the goal of creating hundreds of jobs as we build our own carbon fiber industry in Alberta and Canada. Uh, conventional crude oil has less than 2% of asphaltines, but Alberta oil sand bitumen contains about 15% of bit, uh, asphaltines. Asphaltines are actually problematic to oil production, oil refinery, and pipeline transportation. However, Thread can utilize asphaltines to make value-added carbon fibers. Uh, compared to the process of carbon fiber using polyacrylo natrile or PAN in short as precursors, uh, which currently take up, up to 90% of carbon fiber market, as for teens derived carbon fibers generate half the amount of GHG and consumes a quarter energy in production. Carbon fiber enables uh, lightweight structures that can result in significantly improved power and energy density of system, resulting in reduced material usage and improved efficiency. So we will commit significant R&D to the continued advancement of carbon fiber and its integrity and expanded use on the ground, in the air and beyond. Our vision is to collaborate with the global ecosystem so that they can understand the size and the scale of what we at Threat will be building. Uh, life is uh, carbon-based, we weave it together. Finally, I would like to acknowledge Alberta Innovates and Queen for their leadership and the local bitumen companies for their participation through the bitumen beyond combustion or the BBC opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chen. It's, uh, it's exciting um, to, to see the progress that you guys are making and uh, we'll be watching uh, closely um, as, as uh, you guys move on. Uh, who knows, uh, maybe Thread will be, uh, you know, the, uh, when we look at the TSX in, uh, in 10 years time, maybe it'll be the new, new Shopify um, and uh, we'd be a lot better off. So I wish we should all the success um, as, as you're pioneering forward. We have with us JP Glad. We haven't heard from him yet, which is unusual because JP um, has a lot of thoughtful things to say on a lot of topics. Um, I'm sure most of you know who JP is. He's um, at the center and a real champion in Canada for the power of Indigenous business to create a more just and thriving Canada. Uh, JP, one of his roles, um, he's principal at Mokwetch, but he's one of his roles as well as he's a he's on the board of directors at Suncor Energy, the the largest oil sands company. Be interesting, JP, just to get your perspective. He's been listening to this conversation. 
but what you think, um, but what Laura and Dr. Chen were talking about in terms of uh, opportunities um, for Alberta to kind of go forward, you know, through the lens that you use UC Canada and uh, the power of Indigenous business and, and Suncor. Thank you for that, Toby. Um, I'm incredibly excited. I mean, I'm just having a little bit of a precursor conversation before we opened up to the to the audience. Um, I'm hugely excited about, and as you've heard, and you can see all the questions being generated uh, in the chat box there about the opportunity of adding more value to a barrel of, 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 of oil bitumen. Um, you know, having uh, those types of numbers, I think those are really possible, kind of my reading and, and, and listening into the topics of carbon fiber as an example and, and, and asphalt, by the way, lower wax content means longer roads, uh, existing roads. I mean, as soon as we figure out some of the ambient temperatures for transportation, et cetera, um, I think, you know, as a director and as a shareholder within Suncor, I mean, it's, it's great to, to see um, opportunities for growth. I mean, as, you, as everybody sees, I mean, there's not a lot of investment going into uh, oil sands, so we've got to get better at what we use. And I think that's incumbent on um, any organization, uh, particularly in high energy use or, or natural resources. And, and what resonated, just kind of going back and to maybe tying more into the Indigenous conversation, um, by the way, I'm calling in from my community standpoint, First Nation, northeast of Thunder Bay. Um, so it's a little cold up here and there's a gas line that goes right through my community. But I, as you can see, I got a wood stove. I use carbon neutral heating here. But going back to a conversation that Ralph was bringing to the forefront about incremental change is not going to uh, get us to where we need to in the time that we need to get to, um, particularly around GHG rejections, et cetera. I want to say that the same thing is, is true to the Indigenous relationships in Canada. Um, you know, Suncor is, you know, even before I was with Suncor and I used to run the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, I looked at Suncor as a, as a, as a, as a country leader when it comes to Indigenous relationships, um, not only from an employment and community relationships building perspective, but also um, from um, um, you know, partnerships, real partnerships around equity, um, the, like, for instance, these tanks, uh, uh, tank project or the recent uh, pipeline project with communities, um, this city uh, project. Um, we've got to start thinking bigger in this country. One of the biggest challenges that we have, and and we're if you want incremental change or not, it's 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 going much beyond that. And that the the relationships have come to a head in this country. Our rights are significant, and our ability to skew our wood and use our water, um, just to go back and use some analogies that have already been used. Um, you're not going to be able to do that without our consent. And it's not that Indigenous communities aren't opposed to resource development. And that's another part of the work that I do as, a, as an Indigenous um, leader is communicating that our communities are not necessarily opposed to resource development and all the technologies that are going to advance uh, our, our sectors. It's just we're opposed to the way things have been done in the past. And, uh, you know, I, I just... Um, joking with Laura earlier that you know I'm I was born maybe in the wrong province I spent a lot of time in Alberta I'm also um, the chair of an indigenous advisory group that reports into the energy futures lab on the future fit of hydrocarbons so getting back to the policy pieces and that's going to drive stronger relationships which is going to improve the efficiency of our organizations to do the work on the ground and anything natural resources is really important. We've got to take a step back and understand how we're going to integrate that knowledge history, uh, the traditional knowledge, as well as our land rights and our and, and our growing equity um, positions in these types of projects. It's 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 incredibly uh, incredibly important. Um, so having Indigenous voices is absolutely fundamental to advancing our competitiveness in, in, in this country. Um, I had another thought. I should have written it down. It'll come back to me hopefully any second. Um, but at the end of the day, when we think about um, our trajectory in, 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 in Canada and as, as, uh, uh, as and I think we'll, world leaders in the way that we actually um, um, do oil and gas minus the GHGs that we've got to reduce over time. Ah, that was my thought. I knew I'd eventually get there. Um, is that we've got to really embrace the Indigenous relations. But we also have to get better at government relations. Um, when, when the Pathways Project came to the forefront last year, and you've got 95% of the oil uh, the, the sorry the oil sands uh, producers saying we're committing to net 50 or net zero by 2050 and we can't get a government person 
uh, of any stature from what I understand to show up to support that. I think the best companies, organizations in the world to do, uh, to help reduce our GHGs, get them back in the ground are the same ones that are taking it out of the ground. We've got $30 trillion over the next what, 30, 30 years or whatever it is to contribute to Canada's economy in this just transition, um, we've, got to, we've got to do it very thoughtfully. We just, we, we need to continue to invest in, in partnering and that's gonna take governments, our industry and our indis indigenous communities coming together to, to be very thoughtful and, and pragmatic about the way that we could this. And the incremental change, I absolutely agree with you, Ralph, it's not gonna, it's not gonna do. We've got, we've got to swing for the fences. We've got to do some of the good hard work and the stuff that, that is incrementally changing. Um, the way that we do business, um, um, but, I, but I'm hopeful. Um, so thanks for the opportunity again, Toby, and I hope you're feeling a, a little better. Thanks, JP. And uh, I, I love your, um, your metaphor, swing for the fences on, on more meaningful Indigenous uh, participation and, and decarbonization. And uh, they, they're, they're much more potent combination uh, when they go together than, than, than separate. They probably fall flat separately if they don't go together in, in today's world. So um, really appreciate that perspective. Uh, Murray, it'd be interesting. Uh, we, we talk, we've, we've talked a little bit um, here about uh, big oil. You've got an interesting perspective globally. And, you know, we've got BPs and shells saying they're going to go net zero. We have hedge funds coming to, to you shell. Mean, you, mean the, you mean the energy companies, Toby? Yeah, yeah, was the energy, energy oh. companies. Ener sorry, that is, <laughs> I'm not exactly being facetious, but that's that's what they call themselves these days. So, so yeah, yeah. no, absolutely, a, a few perspectives, and and JP's touched on some great points there, um, and um, you know, like uh, look at look at um, all of the big oil and gas majors. You know, they've got themselves into a, a pretty sticky situation. You know, for pardon the pun, um, but. Uh, they are trying to pull themselves out of it. There's all kinds of stuff going on, I guess, that everybody's aware of. Shell being um, taken to court for various things, you know, other companies, you know, on the verge of that. So liability risk is, is massive, along with physical risk, of course, to their assets through the impacts of climate change. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the transition risk. And, uh, and I think, you know, Laura touched on, on an important point when actually... The way, the way I think about it, I think the way many of us now think about it, it's, it's not about transition, it's about transformation. And uh, I, mean, I mean, without taking key examples, you know, I think BP, you mentioned BP and Shell. BP are a, a great example where they've really embraced the, uh, the principles of sustainability to help them with that, transi that transition and that transformation. Um, you know, a long way to go for them, a long way to go for oil, the, all the oil and gas majors, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, we've worked with, uh, of course, we work with, with almost all of them uh, around the world. Um, and uh, one of the interesting, as I said before, you know, it's useful to have a, a real life case study. You know, one of the interesting things with, uh, uh, with one of those majors is, looking at the physical risk of climate, you know, um, and conducting climate risk analytics with them to help them on that journey. And I think that's the key point. It's about partnering. It's about helping. You know, there's no point in vilifying people or organisations all around the world. Uh, that, all that's going to do is alienate shareholders and stakeholders and, uh, and create further division. Um, it's about working together together. Um, and achieving these goals that we all know we need to hit. And, um, and so, you know, we looked at um, over $100 billion worth of assets in 20 countries, uh, assessing the climate risk um, for them. And, uh, and, you know, we're able to help them report that to the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, which is obviously a really important um, organisation that, that's, that's grown enormously in the last... Uh, four years, and, um, and and we're now working with uh, oil and gas majors on specifically on transition risk, um, and um, and working you know with again as I mentioned before this ecosystem of partners. It, you know I just can't stress it enough because that is a really tangible way of bringing organisations together, um, corporates together, and and in fact um, you know bringing it back down to Canada. 
um, you know, fantastic country I've visited many times and, and look forward to doing so again in the near future um, when um, everything eases up, of course. Uh, you know, I understand, um, you know, from my colleagues and, and from what I, um, what I hear and read about, you know, Canada, you know, and it's, it, it struggles like many other countries do with uh, a desire and commitment to, 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 to set goals and reach those goals. And the, but then it struggles to actually meet them. And I know that, uh, you know, there's, um, there hasn't perhaps been as much progress as people would like against those targets within Canada. But on the other hand, um, you know, you have a situation in Canada where um, competitors, you know, in the oil and gas industry are coming together and bringing um, the dollars to the table for innovation um, to optimize the transition and the transformation that we've just been talking about, you know, using investment dollars and IT to, to try to, to accelerate the process and, um, you know, and, and really just try and address those challenges. So, you know, I think, you know, there's just a few, a few examples there where, um, yes, more needs to be done, but, you know, you've got to start somewhere. And, and if we're working together and, and Canada's doing that, you know, uh, the, the oil and gas majors in Canada appear to be doing that in a big way. Uh, and, and that's quite special. It's not happening everywhere in the world. So let, let's help them uh, and let's work together to, to accelerate that process. Um, that's a couple of thoughts, uh, Toby. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Actually, I have just a quick follow up for you and, and JP, it'd be interesting to get your take on this too. You're talking about how, you know, we've, we've there's some people, we're making progress. Uh, but if we look at oil and gas companies around the world, I think we looked at 329 of them. And um, only two of them over the last five years have made that transition to sort of the transformation pace where they're over 25% of new investments, at least is going into non-oil and gas activities. And uh, ERG, an Italian oil services company and Neste Oil out of Finland are the two companies. And so two out of 120, 329, BP, which we talk about a lot, in 2030, they're saying by 2030, 70% of their investment, new investment in 2030 is still gonna go into oil and gas. And so I just wonder, I guess there's two models here for the traditional oil and gas companies. One is we're going to be using oil and gas for some time. So they um, sort of, it's more of a kind of a sunset model, return cash to shareholders, um, make sure there's no environmental liabilities, be responsible stewards. That's one model. And then uh, the other model is um, do they kind of diversify and uh, become the purveyors of carbon fiber of tomorrow? Um, and I was wondering what, uh, you know, what you thought, what you think makes more sense, um, you know, can the, can the incumbents be the champions of the clean economy tomorrow? Um, you know, do you, um, do you have to be part of the solution, part of the problem in order to be part of the solution? Uh, what do you think makes more sense as a model to sort of sunset or diversify if you're thinking about sort of global oil and gas companies? Uh, just quickly from you and JP, would be interesting to get that perspective. Sure. I, I think there's a scale. I, I, I don't. And, and, and at the risk going back to that incremental change, I mean, there's there's I think when you work in any kind of environment, if you don't have regulatory certainty, um, if you're if you're if you're if you're struggling to cap, to to capture capital uh, and, and attract capital globally, um, you're going to be a little bit more reticent to jump into like a BP situation where they're you know, they're they're taking a big swing. I mean, that's really important. Uh, here in Canada, um, I, there's, I mean, uh, Murray, thank you very much for your compliments to our country. We still struggle, I think. We do a lot of great things well, but our regulatory process is a mess. And when your regulatory process is a mess, that creates uncertainty. And so if you've got uncertainty, it's hard to, to make those uh, crystal ball um, 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 uh, investments. Uh, to be able to make sure that you're you're not going to do your shareholders wrong because you still have to operate your base um, and make those transitions over time. So if we have a little more clarity, and I'm not speaking for Suncor by any means, but I think for any organization, when you have a little bit more certainty and clarity, you can make those bigger swings. And at this point, I don't necessarily see a lot of that. I think the chasm uh, between uh, the cliff where we are um, jumping into um, 
uh, into the, the green energy and, and, and I do a lot in conservation and sustainable development as well. And I absolutely agree with you, Mary, we've got to stop operating in silos, come together for solutions, figure out what we can agree on in that peripheral stuff that we have a uh, debate in. We'll get to that, but let's, let's, and let's, it's not perfect. Like you, like both you and Laura said, it's not perfect, but let's get started on some of these solutions. Um, so, you know, I, I think it takes the mix out of those two and 162, I think, or whatever the number was, uh, Toby. Um, good on them. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to learn from, from their actions as well as their government in creating that space in the global economy as that continues because we're, we're, we're very different nationally and we're very different globally and there's a, there's a lot of challenge and opportunity to, to harmonize our approach. Yeah, I thought I'd, I'd agree with that, JP. Just a quick point, Toby. I know we're running, we're running close on time here, but um, <clears throat> I think you find that most of the oil and gas companies are diversifying in some way, shape, or form, and um, and that's a that's inevitable. You know, they they have the shareholders; they they want to survive, and and I think the point is here: it is about survival. That's what the transformation is about. If they don't transform, they're not going to survive. And um, but if you look at most of the the big, especially European based or Canadian based, I think there's a there's a lot of investment going into, uh, particularly in Europe, into uh, wind. And, uh, and solar, uh, you look at some of the, the ones we've mentioned already, they have huge investments into different uh, energy um, sources and, and therefore you know, are able to provide that. And, and that should be encouraged. Um, and they have, a lot of, they have a lot of money to be able to do it. And, and I'll make one final point that you, we cannot um, just, you know, fragment the oil and gas industry away from the financial services industry. And it's so important that we engage with financial services and help them in their transition so that they can then help their clients, their, the companies that they're invested in, like the oil and gas, to assist them in their transition as well and their transformation. And so, you know, this is a symbiotic relationship. You can't just take a, an oil and gas company and and tell them what to do or help them what to do alone because they need support from other places such as the financial services uh, sector. And uh, so that, again, that's something where we, we need to play a role and, and assist in that, in that transformation. Yeah, I think, and thanks for making that point, Marie, the, the importance of transition linked finance. And uh, we're seeing a lot of innovations even coming out of uh, Canada. Bank of Montreal has done some really interesting things in this, this area as a whole team. Uh, looking at opportunities um, as do uh, other banks, but Bank of Montreal really doing some interesting stuff. Uh, we, one thing we didn't discuss, um, just, to, just, just to put a toehold there, because it should be mentioned in this conversation, is the potential for deep geothermal. Um, you, know, just, you, you need drills and drilling capacity and certain geology, and Canada's got all those things, and it's, it's a beautiful, non-intermittent, stable, steady supply of potential um, power and heat, uh, which uh, could be a nice way of decarbonizing and, and using assets that we have. Um, but we have just a few minutes left, and I, I wanted to ask each of you, uh, starting with, with Chris, uh, then Laura, then Dr. Chen, then JP, and then Murray, to, um, as concisely as possible in a minute and a half or two minutes, uh, just to, to share a final call to action um, from you. One big idea for Canada's uh, natural resource minister to do the most carbon reduction for the greatest economic benefit. Um, so I'll start, start, start first uh, with Chris. Um, the simplest thing, and I think we're getting there, is what we call directionality is, you know, all our sectors have to get to net zero. Everyone has, everyone needs to give up the idea of using offsets, however permanent and verifiable, to get to zero emissions one way or the other, because they're going to be very expensive. And we're, and in order to meet the global goals, we're going to have to go net negative, probably before 2050, the way things are rolling right now, we're going to have to go to negative emissions, which means sucking CO2 out of the air using biomass or direct air capture and pushing it underground, which means there is no room uh, by, by 2050 to get to, for anybody still emitting. Um, now that, that's the bad on, that's the bad side on the good side. I, I think we need a national conversation. Like we still need all, all these industries we have are critical. The labor they represent, the skills they represent, the financial capability, the, you know, it, it, they're all woven into get, 
woven together as uh, as uh, Dr. Simpson just just noted, especially the financial industry, it's, its tentacles are are in everything, right? So we need a very detailed national vision of how we're going to take the oil and gas industry to net zero in, into a profitable net zero future. We need to take steel, cement, petrochemicals. Petrochemicals I see as being an integral to a profitable oil and gas future and other options such as beyond bitumen, beyond bitumen for combustion. But all our sectors need to go to zero and that needs to be absolutely clear to everyone. There is no, there is no room for remaining emissions now. And we, but we can do this. It, it's fully possible, but we need to be thinking that we need to be thinking 38 where we need to be 30 years ahead and, and that everything will fall out of that. So following on from, from Chris's point, um, absolutely. And from my tech world, I call it a systems approach. Let's look at a systems approach for the multiple uses of technologies that we're gonna be talking about, whether it's CCUS, hydrogen, bitumen beyond combustion, uh, small nuclear reactors, whatever it may be, we need an approach. And within that, I'll concentrate on my one big issue uh, I wanna bring up on BBC. BBC can have bitumen beyond combustion, the carbon fiber, the new materials, the semi-precious metals, the asphaltines, the activated carbon, can have a powerful driver to industry to adopt things earlier because there's an economic output for their shareholders. To do this, we really need a national scale lab to test for not just the great technologies people like Dr. Chen have been pursuing to date, but the new tech, the continuing new technologies that we're going to develop a need to test before any industry is going to put into their full manufacturing or their big investment cycles at scale. So I think if there's one thing on BBC we could do, let's get a national uh, scale lab to test. So industry, so in this, JP, I'll use your words in this, um, or my words of your interpretation, in this <clears throat> complex and uncertain uh, policy environment, let's at least give some tools to the industry where they can come see, come participate, come do, and help along this transformation uh, at not just their speed, but the speed that others can help them at, uh, like entrepreneurs. So thank you. Thanks, Laura. Dr. Chen? Oh, I just want to emphasize the importance of collaboration with the global ecosystems. And carbon fiber is not new material, has been manufactured for many decades. So uh, we, uh, once the price uh, is reduced and then there's a whole spectrum of products and applications can be developed, we seeking collaborations uh, with uh, uh, global ecosystem. JP? I think, that, yeah, okay, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but we'll come to no surprise to folks around the indigenous issues. And I was referring to a lot of the regulatory instability, uncertainty, and a lot of that stems because of the poor relationships that we have with our indigenous communities in this country. And there's a whole regulatory reform, um, in my opinion, um, with regards to indigenous, having indigenous uh, communities and relations co-drive um, processes. I know there's a lot of technology that may be slightly out of reach, but there are also a lot of sophisticated indigenous communities and companies that are participating in this sector, creating room for the indigenous economy, both through equity, through regulatory, uh, through capital investments. There's, a, there's some big challenges around there is going to create uh, there's create more certainty, which our country really, I think, largely lacks. So um, <clears throat> I've touched on the main points, I think, a couple of times, but uh, I guess um, just to reiterate, there um, obviously regulation is is tricky everywhere. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it fluctuates, it changes, and it's and it's not uniform around the globe, which is a one of the biggest issues, of course. When we're trying to deal with a global problem and we've seen that in the pandemic and we can and we've seen it for decades in the climate um sphere and um but you know regulation is increasing uh pressure from shareholders is increasing uh, on all sectors all of the sectors that we've mentioned today uh it's massive there's a, there's a huge amount of scrutiny from the public from the press 
um, you know, all around the world. And that's only going to continue to increase. And, um, and to address, you know, these issues, uh, we need to work together. And, and this is where I come back to one of my points that I made at the beginning in ecosystems of, of partnerships across sectors and within corporations and value chains and supply chains working together um, for the you know for the benefit of each other um, and through that creating ecosystems of data and if we if we can gather that data then we have something really meaningful that we can use you know capture that data measure it benchmark it and then report it for the c-suite for operations for the public be transparent be consistent and uh, and then we will we'll be able to make a difference together and that that really is absolutely key uh, and and that so that would be my main message thanks toby and thank you again uh, for the invitation great panel great session well um i i'd, I'd really like to thank uh, you and all the panelists um for for sharing your wisdom today and also like to thank all of the, the attendees who uh, participated with great vigor, uh, well over 100 comments uh, going on in the discussion. So really appreciate um, all of the attendees because we're all part of this uh, together, pushing this compact forward to, um, to, to move, move things fast at, at speed and, and scale. So really appreciate everyone coming out today. And again, appreciate IBM enabling this, uh, these, these great sessions with, together with us. So we have two um, sessions remaining in the Canadian Earth Index series. The next one will be in two weeks, the green renovation wave. Uh, that's the, the building sector. And then we're going to be going into the green agriculture wave the week after on February the 2nd. So we hope you can join us for those. And uh, in the meantime, uh, stay safe, uh, stay warm, and, uh, and let's drive down the carbon and, and go up the value chain. Um, thank you, everyone. Ha have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.